Okay, good morning. Everyone awake? Yeah. <laughs> it's great to be back uh, to this team. I can't believe this is the 35th conference. It's really a tribute to the ASAP team, you know, who are floating around, you know, Patrice and Patricia, Jamie, um, and where's Dr. Levy, who really helped organize, like, thanks so much for hosting us here. It's really great to be back in San Diego. So. We wouldn't miss this. Uh, it's so special, this meeting. It's so unique in what we do in, in the neurosurgery world because it's the first chance we really get to interact with families and patients and hear from you all, you know, what, what we need and what we need, where we need to go. You know, we might get complacent with Chiari and feel like we know it all. And then we hear from you at this meeting and we get very humbled, you know, of that we have a long way to go to figure this out and understand, you know, what's important and quality of life, you know, many things we need to consider about, about at least the surgical aspects of Chiari. And we just heard that brilliant talk, you know, about connective tissue, Mylene. I mean, that's so important to what we do. And, you know, we don't really have the, the background to even think about some of those things, the genetics and how much we're learning, you know, week to week about some of these disorders, I think are exciting. When Patrice kept saying, what are you gonna talk about? What are you gonna talk about? You know, we try to change things up every time. You know, I thought, well, there's got to be a lot about Chiari surgery and where it, where it was at one point and where we're going. And thinking about the evolution of the surgical aspects of Chiari and what we do, many families ask, you know, you know, based on Google probably, you know, a lot of specific questions. You know, do you do this? Do you do that? And, you know, we don't know if any of these things even matter, right? We, some of these haven't been studied rigorously, most haven't been studied, and we're trying to make heads or tails on what's the right thing to do for these patients, how to customize surgery, um, how are things different for, say, a patient with EDS? That's a common question we get um, in terms of Chiari surgery. So I thought it'd be fun to take a bit of a tour of kind of where we were and where we're going, but at the end of the day, many of us learn this from you know, mentors like Dr. Batstorff here, in the room and we do it the same way. <laughs> we haven't evolved that much, sadly, and we haven't really innovated surgically for Chiari. You know, I think we have a lot more we could do here and think about doing the same operation. And is that the right operation? We try to be consistent, right, with how we do things. We don't want to change it e each patient because we don't know any better. So we try to really keep consistent with what we do because we think it works, right, and how we do it. But I'm sure if you poll the surgeons here, we all do things quite differently, actually, when you get to the nitty gritty of what we do. So Patrice gave me three hours for this talk, which is great. I appreciate it, Patrice. She, she left the room. Oh no, Eric's here now to keep me. <laughs> so Chiari, is, as you know, is so complex. And when I talk about Chiari, it's Chiari and Syringomyelia, right? I know you can't read this, but there's so many symptoms we think about. I remember I had the medical students in the OR yesterday, we were doing a Chiari and, you know, I asked what's the definitions. I always like to quiz them on all the different types of Chiari, which keep going up, as you know. You know, Chiari 0, 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, 2, 3, 4. I always ask them about Chiari 5, which doesn't exist yet, luckily. Um, but, it, you know, they always think inevitably that Chiari is based on symptoms. And as you know, it's a radiologic definition, and that's this disconnect we have, right? Chiari and symptoms, they may not go together. And do we really know all these symptoms? And how many of these are true Chiari related? How many of these symptoms will get better with surgery? You know, we get those questions a lot. Beyond headache and whatnot, Valsalva headaches, those things make sense. But what about frontal headaches? What about all these other things, what about speech, memory, cognition? All these things come up, which are really difficult for us to know, do they get better? Have they gotten better in some patients? Absolutely, you know, there's definitely links, but we just don't understand them very well. So we go back to the history, you know, of Chiari, and this is a really nice paper, if any of you are interested in history buffs um, about Chiari, but there's a lot of history about how Chiari uh, was diagnosed, and I'm sure Dr. Batstorff can give us this talk uh, much more eloquently than, than I can. But, you know, Hans Chiari was not a neurosurgeon, you know, was a pathologist, okay? And he was noticing Chiari malformations at the time, didn't call it that, 
but noted on autopsies of a woman, particularly that died of typhoid fever and had hydrocephalus, that the cerebellar tonsils were jammed much lower than they should have. And that was the first time, 1891, you know, obviously no MRI back then, trying to think about what does this even mean? Um, and then Julius Arnold, because we call this the Arnold Chiari malformation, right? That's not one person, it's actually two people, um, described another case a few years later, incidental findings in a single patient. You know, it's, it's amazing what, where this came from, from very few patients, right? And basically on pathology, on autopsy, of looking at a problem that probably had nothing to do with what we're talking about today. You know, hydrocephalus may be a because of something else going on that secondarily may have caused the Chiari. And then a couple of the students felt bad and they called this the Arnold Chiari malformation with or without hydrocephalus. And particularly the without hydrocephalus, I think, was where it really started to have traction of understanding what this even meant. But these aren't surgeons. So you think about well, when was the first time Chiari was operated on? Um, well, it wasn't for another 40 years later, where uh, this gentleman, um, I don't know if you can pronounce it, Graftique, started to do these posterior fossa decompressions. And what was he doing at the time? He was widening the space of the brain that herniated to follow better flow of CSF. Well, 1930, has anything changed in 100 years? Here we are, here doing the same exact thing that he was doing back then. Um, and if you look technically at what he was doing, it was a much bigger decompression than we talk about today. Um, he decompressed the posterior fossa, large area of bone, but think about the tools they had then. They didn't have little micro drills, they didn't have a microscope. They used these big rongeurs that they used on the primates, on the monkeys, you know, and applied them to humans and um, opened the dura and actually took the tonsils out is the best way to, to solve this problem. They didn't know any other way to do it, and we still do that today on occasion. And Dr. Bonizzi will be talking about this tomorrow. Um, but not everyone did very well from this surgery, and it probably had nothing to do with the actual surgery. They didn't die during the surgery, but they died later from anesthesia or who knows what, what happened, but that, that's obviously not an acceptable result. So then we go 100 years beyond that, and we think, well, we obviously we're doing incredible things now. Look what's changed. We have beautiful toys in the operating room we all love, and instruments, and beautiful microscopes, and 3D video, all sorts of things. But does that really change our outcome or change the way we do things? And these are newer papers. You know, This is a very recent paper. This came out. And I was thinking, wow, this is going to be really exciting to see what What's happening? You know, 2023, you know, a new technical note. Um, not a whole lot there. Basically, using navigation, you know, I don't know how relevant. I'm curious to the surgeons. You know, do you think navigation would help us here, finding C1 or C2? We, we feel that we could do that without navigation. Does that really enhance our ability to help the patient in some way? Um, Ultrasound bone cutter. Well, that's another way of taking bone off. They claim it has a lower CSF leak rate, but that's just another tool. And we use that in the spine sometimes, and it, it's a neat tool. But does that really help the patient in some unique way 100 years later? I would beg to differ. I would say a lot of these are just the way we do things, and they're, they're cool instruments. And, but there's not a whole lot beyond that. You know, intraoperative ultrasound. I use more and more. You know, I think it's in incredible what we're seeing on ultrasound that, you know, we've used it on the, as a pediatric young adult neurosurgeon. I mean, well, I use this routinely on kids, but now I use it on every patient just to look. Now, I don't use it in a way that, okay, I'm not going to open the bone or not. I often am opening for syrinxes and whatnot. We can talk about that later. But, you know, I think it's fascinating what you see in the ultrasound. Um, that things we take for granted, that we never can look at that kind of flow and change inside the dura. Um, that, that case yesterday I was describing, I used it and it had a huge dural band. It was about a centimeter, if you know what a dural band is. It, it's right at the frame of magnum there where it can really compress the, the dura. And 
it was amazing how much that indented you know, the spinal flow. And as soon as I took that out, everything looked so normal. And then you think, well, should I open the bone? I haven't even really thought of that, you know, because I don't use the ultrasound, but now I'm doing that more and more. And it, it's helpful because then I, when I really need it, I really can understand what things look like before and after decompression. You have to have your own gestalt. Well, what else is out there? Another great new paper about endoscopy, you know, endoscopy, you know, a tiny incision two centimeters, you know, usually incisions are a little longer, right? So two centimeters, does that make a difference? And you can do some amazing things with the endoscope. We, we do this all the time now through endoscopic approaches, you know, in the ventricle, through the nose or spine. But this is different in how we think about it for Chiari. Will this enhance outcome? Um, you know, for spine, this is an exciting area because they go home the same day, it's minimally invasive. Is that the same for Chiari? Will we back off on the decompression because of endoscopy and then we have other things that we constrain? We can't maybe do as big of a decompression. We, can we put a patch in? All these things might change how we do that surgery because we're now adapting to the endoscope. We have to be careful of that, that we don't have more failures because now we did it endoscopically. And we've seen that in, in neurosurgery over the years of, it's cute, it's minimally invasive, but the long-term result may not be as good, may not be as durable. So we're watching all this carefully. We're always doing this and practicing it, but keep an eye on this. And it, there's several series out about endoscopy, but I wouldn't say you really know what's better or worse. It, it's an interesting idea. The idea is, of course, that you can minimize pain in the post-operative period. There's less muscle dissection, less muscle disruption, and we've done this for spine that seems to be the, the merit in terms of faster recovery. But their hospital stay was really no different than mine. It was a few days. So I'm not sure it really was something that, okay, they're leaving the next day or something that dramatic. We're still opening the dura. We still have the same issues. You know, there's leak risks, there's aseptic meningitis, there's things like that that are gonna come up no matter how you open or close, okay? But this is, I think, interesting. You know, the endoscopic assisted, we can look around corners, we can do things. They say we don't have to wear a cervical brace. Now, I, I polled the surgeons here, how many of you put your patients in a brace after Chiari surgery? In fact, I do the opposite. I want them to move their neck. We want them to have that mobility, or I think it gets pretty constrained, but we can talk about that. I'm just feeding this panel later that I'm sure you're gonna have questions uh, for, for when we do that, because this is a lot of, a lot of work that we do that we think we know what we're doing and it's the right thing. But I love this conference because we always hear about many other ways to do things. But better lighting, clear visualization, reduced trauma, totally agree endoscopically you could potentially accomplish that. The discharge time and wearing a brace, I'm not so sure. But it's minimally invasive. You can see you can open the dura on each side. You can do these things that you can decide if this is going to be enough for your decompression or not. Jerry Oakes, who uh, um, has always talked to me about this, is, you know, is Chiari a midline operation or is it a lateral operation? And this is more of a philosophical thing of, you know, those tonsils can be so jammed around the sides, around Lushka, we call it, from a Lushka, or is it a midline, just decompress in the midline? You know, these are controversies that we always talk about Ultrasound has a tough time showing those lateral gutters. It's a midline tool. So these are, again, advantages, disadvantages with the techniques that we have. But, you know, it looks nice on paper, has these nice little ovals you could do endoscopically. The time it takes to do these are no better and no faster than what we do open. So it's not like it's a quick, slick thing in and out. It's still a three to four hour surgery, potentially even longer doing it endoscopically. So I'm just highlighting some of these things because it, it's something to, you might hear about this, right, in the clinic. So I do it endoscopically, so let's, well, I'm gonna go there. But we just don't quite know, you know, what that means yet. And we're obviously eager to learn and understand it because it, it has caught on for other things that we do. Now, Bob Keating's not, not here. He's sailing off England somewhere. He's usually at this conference. Um, and uh, he has a really nice, nice paper thinking about how we're evolving you know, with Chiari and how we think about things, which I think is really a good paper if you want to take a look at that. 
2019. Um, it's not too outdated based on what I'm telling you over 100 years and how things have evolved. But I think you'll find it interesting. And there's a lot that comes out of this, right? We compare dural graphs. You know, this has been a hot topic over the years, particularly when I published a paper back when I was a resident, young faculty at Duke way back, um, that um, the graphs we use and the sealants we put in are very important. You know, they're exposed to the CSF. It's very important to get that right. And we use a lot of these sealants which can have trouble, and we have to be very careful of that, or particularly the interactions of these graphs and the sealant, which may be from different companies. So it's something we, I've paid a lot of attention to and I've studied over the years, and this is very important. And I was attached to a graft for several years and just went off, the FDA just pulled it, you know, so now we gotta figure out something else and we hope it works just as well. But you can use the patient's own tissue. There's other ways to do things, of course, but there's a lot of grafts out there, but they're not the same. And we have to be respectful of that. And these have been studied and looked at, but I would say there's really no clear evidence that one is better than the other um, when you think about what you're using. But the graphs and how we sew things and how, what layers we put on top. I know you just had breakfast. I'm not going to show you a lot of gory videos. I'm sorry for that. Patrice told me not to do that. So, But what are the technique considerations that we think may make a difference? Well, we've studied this rigorously. Dave Limbrick has looked at this, right, in a very large study we've all been part of to randomize patients opening the dura versus not for a syrinx in Curie. And this... We're finally getting to learn some of the evidence about that, that, you know, may, of course, the complication risk may be a little bit higher, but otherwise maybe we don't have to open the door as much as we thought. Definitely something we want to be thoughtful on, but will this change practice? Unlikely. You know, we all do things in a way which is pretty regimented over the years that we feel works or doesn't work. It's very hard to say have a study change practice and I'm not sure this study is going to do that for us to be something pivotal to say, I'm going to do it differently now. But that's the big question of any study that we have. Does that mean I'm done? <laughs> um, the arachnoid, there's this glistening layer of arachnoid when we open the dura. Should we open it? You know, this is a pristine environment in there. Everything we do inside the dura can cause scarring, right? We have to be very careful and cognizant if anything, I've gotten more and more conservative over the years inside the dura, what I do, because you look at redos and what happens and things stick. And when things stick, there's trouble, you know, down the road. We're always looking at CSF flow. We've got to restore that flow. We're always looking at the brainstem and the obex. We don't want to miss any webs or anything that could affect that flow. That's very, very important. And if it's a syrinx that didn't go down, we're always thinking, well, do we address all that? And if it wasn't done at your center, you have to think, okay, call the other surgeon, and did they look at those spaces? We don't want to have to go back if it's not necessary, right? That's a big deal going back on these surgeries. And despite Google, it's not that common, right? It's not like 90% need a reoperation. It's somewhere in the 10 to 12%. So it's not as high as, as, as noted or what people are thinking how much you deal with the tonsils, how much you manipulate them, you know, that, that's important. Does that matter long-term? And this is something we want to understand and, and talk about at this meeting. Do you want to touch them at all? There are some that I know don't even touch them, um, particularly on the adult side. Um, you know, they, they're much more conservative than the pediatric age. Stents, you know, we have little tubes we can put in. Sometimes on redos this comes up because it's so scarred. It was treacherous to open up all the flow, and gosh, you don't want to do that again. It looks so beautiful at the end. Don't think that that's not just going to rescar down in six months. I wish it weren't the case, but we have to sometimes put in little tubes, and those tubes are also a risk. You know, those tubes can migrate. They can end up in the spine. You got to sew them in, but you're sewing them to very small tissues. Uh, Dr. Mike Scott, you know, a neurosurgeon in Boston Children's for many years, used to call it the puke tube because they stick right up against the vomiting center, you know? And so these, anything we do, there's a risk benefit and we always have to be thoughtful. Is that the right thing? And not just think about that day, but six months, years down the road, you know, for this child or, or adult. The dural graft I talked about, the sealants, 
There's a lot of voodoo there, what we do and what we like that I'm sure we probably all use a different sealant here in the room. We can pull that on the panel. Um, and muscle closure, I think this is important. You know, there's a layer of defense of that muscle. I personally really like to get that sealed and closed as that second layer of defense. So I, I think that's an important part of this. So if you do get a small leak or something from a, say a child with higher pressures that it's very hard to seal, at least that muscle will keep things contained. You don't want CSF leaking out of the skin or things like that. And sometimes you have regrowth of bone. Um, if you don't patch, the bone will grow a lot of it right back and you have to you know, do that, even in adults. It's amazing how much that bone can grow back. So failing late, you know, it's always back to what were the goals of the surgery to begin with? It's really thinking about you know, expectations, setting those expectations. Well, I would hope this would get better. I don't know about that. It, we don't want to over, over promise because the patient won't be happy in the end. We have to be honest with what are they going through? What are the symptoms? Is this worth the surgery to operate on the Chiari? This is a radiographic MRI diagnosis, right? I'm not talking about a syrinx or something, but just a Chiari 1 or 1.5, no syrinx, very important decision. That judgment is the most important decision there. Do we operate or not? The comorbidities were just highlighted of how important those are and how much those affect outcome. That's not just for Chiari. I mean, in spine, this is true as well, right? These comorbidities are huge in how the response of the patient going through surgery and buffing them up for that kind of surgery is not trivial. Um, intradural scarring, we, we talked about that scarring that might come up. The decompression might be too small, might be too big. It's that Goldilocks, you know, perfect size that is the right balance. You know, we sure have seen patients way too large decompressed. And if anything, over the 100 years, maybe we've gotten smaller and smaller and more strategic in our decompression. I feel that is the case when I look at old scans, you know, where the decompression was way up to the torcular, way up high, you know, to the sinus, large decompressions that really was not, not needed. The intracranial hypertension haunts us for Chiari. And we know this can happen as a comorbidity. Those pressures can be high, and that can affect leaks. It can, it's amazing, though, what, it's a chicken-egg thing, but you have to be very careful. In children, they sometimes have eye swelling called papal edema before surgery, and then I'm thinking, oh gosh, well, I don't wanna do the Chiari, but actually doing the Chiari surgery, the papilledema goes, goes away because their CSF flow is restored. Everything calms down and the eyes normalize. I don't wanna shunt that patient. I fix the CSF flow. So these things are not, not so easy sometimes to think about, but that hypertension is important. Hydrocephalus is different than ventricular megaly. Okay, hydrocephalus is much more extreme, but a lot of Chiari patients have increased ventricles. They're just a little bit larger than normal. And a couple things can happen with those. They can get bigger after surgery or they can get smaller. We've got to watch those very carefully. You can have these pseudomeningoceles, uh, which are leaking out of the patch, you know, that can haunt us and can be trouble. But often they calm down and, and relax on their own. So I, I don't rush back in to deal with those. And of course, we're always thinking about the syrinx and watching that syrinx being patient I've gotten more patient to watch these on scans because sometimes we're surprised over time. We don't need to rush in and go back or something if we felt like we've done everything we could. Tethered cord can come up. We always look at that up front. I do in terms of a full spine before any time I operate. And then the instability question, which can also be a concern, and especially in a young child, why that syrinx isn't getting better and a big, large ligament up front up against the brainstem. Um, uh oh. Oh, I'm almost done, I'm almost done. So this is something which is a really interesting paper that um, is pretty recent about mimickers of Chiari. And this is a really interesting area. Not all of this is Chiari. You know, I, I saw a patient this week said, oh, I have a Chiari, but it really wasn't a Chiari. The tonsils were normal. It was tight, posterior fossa. Frame of magnum was very tight, but that's a little different type of thing. You know, the Chiari is a very clear diagnosis in terms of the imaging. We have to be very careful. We don't just call everything Chiari when they're not. Um, 
But the arachnoiditis, these dural bands, the hypotension, I'll comment on in a second, the high pressure, arachnoid cysts, all these are mimickers, say when you have a large arachnoid cyst in the back that's secondarily causing a Chiari. You know, do you fix the cyst, do you do the Chiari, you know, you, or both? You know, these are things that, you know, we have to be very thoughtful about. You know, Duke is a large CSF leak center, and I have seen so many patients since I've been back there now, and I, I've worked very closely with a partner there, Dr. Linda Gray, um, who has the really uh, sophisticated imaging techniques with the photon scanner now to really look at those leaks, look at those venous fistulas, and it's amazing how it's so hard to tell sometimes, you know, is this Chiari, is this a patient with intracranial hypotension with low pressure, where we're gonna do a blood patch and, and basically, you know, they, they get better. We don't wanna operate on those people. You know, that's not the right thing. We have to be careful to tease those out, but it's getting harder and harder for me to tell, you know, these Chiari, pseudo Chiari, mimicking Chiari's, you know, the neck stiffness, the absence of this back of the, the brain and looks looking very normal back there. The covering of the brain lights up on MRI, so we often give contrast and can see that. We don't usually give contrast, you know, for Chiari patients. It's not something we do routinely. Uh, we do it now more regularly for the adults. They may have had, I said, a recent LP or a spinal tap. This can be very remote. It could be, you know, a pregnancy 20 years ago and they had an epidural and they got in. It wasn't epidural, it was actually a spinal and they talked about the headaches they had, which then got better. You know, this can be a very remote spinal tap that could have led to this intracranial hypotension years later. You know, this is some of the, what you could see you know, with all the enhancement of the coverings of the brain, how it all just lights up. And then the sagging of the brain from the leak from below, how it causes these hygromas in the brain. And this is not something we, this is, or is something that we see after Chiari surgery sometimes. Particularly, I see this in the kids that have larger ventricles. You do the Chiari and everything just kind of collapses because it's in shock about all the new CSF flow and everything's now working normally. But this is also something we got to be very careful prior to surgery. If you see this, that's not a patient you want to necessarily do Chiari surgery on. But look at the symptoms and go back to that first slide I showed you about all the different things. All these are on that list, okay? They're all on that list I showed you for Chiari about intracranial hypotension. How are we going to tell these apart? They're difficult. You know, even this upright posture. Headaches, I, I've had a kid, maybe she was 15, was when I was still at Stanford, you know, couldn't get up, just debilitated, could not get up. I said, she's gotta have a leak. I don't wanna fix her Chiari. Did the myelograms, nothing. I just couldn't, I didn't know what to do. I was really re reluctant to do the Chiari surgery. Finally, I did it, fine, absolutely fine. Back to playing sports, I mean, just fine. Now, now she had only this. Worse in the day, couldn't get up, very postural symptoms. Why did she present like a patient with intracranial hypotension? I don't understand that, but it just shows you that we don't know the whole answer here. We have to be listening to our patients to really try to understand this. And sometimes we take risks together to try, but not knowing if the outcome will be good or bad. But we have to be very honest with this is what we're doing. I think that's the most important. I'm sure all the surgeons here had that same mentality that, that that's why we're here today. The last uh, two slides, you know, if we really just don't know where we're going, what do we do now? <coughs> Chat GBT, right? <laughs> here we go. Future of Chiari surgery 2030. I mean, I was very impressed. So minimally invasive techniques, we talked about that. Maybe we'll be doing some endoscopy or Precision personalized medicine. Well, this is where all medicine's going, right? Genetics, biomarkers. Wouldn't that be nice if we had a biomarker to say, you would respond well to Chiari surgery? What do we have now? We don't have anything like that. But maybe in the future, we would have a way to personalize their treatment beyond imaging, which would be exciting, I think, for this field. And that's something all of us here in ASAP and other re folks that care about research can really help foster, that we can really try to understand more 
about Chiari and personalize that unique genetic makeup and health profile. We're doing it for spine. Why don't we apply it to Chiari? Um, neuroimaging innovations. Well, we looked at Cine CSF flow over the years. Has that really been something that has transformed our understanding or who to operate on? Not so much. It's been very soft in terms of really telling us yes, no, or going to do well or not from a surgical intervention, which is really what we need to know. But also not miss out on those that really could benefit. Um, just the same as not doing surgery when we probably don't need to. Uh, so neuroimaging, I think, is exciting. You know, I've done a lot of work with the radiologist to try to push that envelope, and there's some really neat techniques, both through G and Siemens, that are exciting, particularly that could be applied to Chiari that I hope we, can, we could use, you know, for our patients. What about, what about robots? Well, it's exciting, like the da Vinci you might hear about. We're not there yet for neuro. Those instruments are way too big for what we do. But they're in the corner of my OR. I always look at it going, huh, is this where we're going to be? You know, meaning you're not even in the room. You're in a back room console, and the robot's doing the surgery. You know, is that our future? Not in the near term. But ChatGPT thinks so by 2030. OK. Um, Biocompatible materials. This is important. These are, you know, there are allergy risks. You heard about the mast cell issues, the connective tissue problems. This stuff does matter, and the more we can develop good graphs and sealants, this will be a good thing for the field. This is very exciting in, in our world, in neurosurgery, particularly the ability to modulate circuits, to change how the brain functions. Okay, to rewire and promote that rewiring, say with focused ultrasound. A lot of things that are coming down the pike that not so much for Chiari yet, but for other things that I think are gonna be really fun to think about how we apply them to Chiari patients because they're not invasive. That's the exciting part. At, at one point you could do deep brain stimulation and all, we're not there. But focused ultrasound, watch that carefully because we're now applying that to depression, OCD, and other things. And you can see where that's going, that maybe some of these will be beneficial. And regeneration, you know, could this be something to repair, you know, when you've, there's loss of function? That's always something that is tough for us in, in, in the neurosurgery space, when you've lost function, you know, can you get it back? We're obviously trying to prevent them from getting worse, but can we restore function? This neurorestoration is a very exciting area of, of uh, neuroscience, which I hope we can capitalize on. And, and the future, this is a great ChatGPT quote. I couldn't have said this any better. You know, medical advancements, unforeseen developments need rigorous testing before adoption. Great. <laughs> the field of medicine, it's almost like a caveat. They put this in there as a disclaimer. Field of medicine's evolving. We got to collaborate together to shape the future of Chiari malformation surgery. This is beautiful stuff. It's amazing what ChatGPT is doing these days, but it can't do surgery. It can't tell us who to operate on and who not to operate on to get that patient better. I'm sorry I have to show a Duke slide. Basketball season's coming. So um, thanks so much for your attention. Look forward to the panel.